we should explain what your job title is. Uh, great. So thank you for having me. It's nice to see many new and old friends here today. Um, so I've been at Twitter for about four and a half years, and I run what we call our global media team. It's a new job um, for you. It's a newer job, yes. And, um, and it's basically just an expansion of what I had been doing before. And um, what our team does is we help get high quality content and develop what we call participation experiences on Twitter. A um, little bit of a mouthful, but, um, but the goal with that is if we can have this vibrant conversation on Twitter, um, that ultimately translates into growth, engagement, and distribution. So well, let's unpack that, as they sure. say. So uh, what did you say, vibrant global content? What was the, the phrase you used? It was a mouthful, I couldn't get it. So you, in English, you right, you're going to Twitter. people who make media, like networks yeah. and filmmakers, uh, and getting them to do more stuff on Twitter, and then you go to celebrities, basically, and famous people, and say, get on Twitter more. It's that or it's they come to us and ask us, how do we get the most out of the platform? How do we reach more users? What are best practices? And so we actually have teams around the world. We have teams in now 14 markets um, that work with those high, pro high profile content creators. And it spans across television and music and government and sports and a number of different verticals. So it's 2014, Twitter's been around for many years now. Yep. You guys have I don't know, 300 million users, give or take. Right? 285 million. 285 million specifically. Um, do you need to explain why they sh people should be on Twitter at this point, or do they all get it? Well, the thing is we have really big uh, awareness of Twitter. If you go around the world, I've traveled a lot with Twitter, and there is very high awareness of what the product is. Um, so it's not so much explaining what Twitter is, but um, how do we simplify um, how to use it, and what are the best ways to be able to discover content, to create content? Because there's, there's, the, there's a, one of the, the ongoing discussions about Twitter is it's not big enough, it should be a billion people, but it, well, why isn't it a billion people? Well, maybe the product's too complicated for regular people to understand. Do the, the celebrities and, and content companies you're dealing with, do they get what it is and what the value is? Yeah, it's a, it's a natural platform for anybody in sort of a high profile place because it's the first place you can go to connect with people everywhere in an instant. So, um, so it hasn't been difficult to explain the value and the opportunity. Um, and if you think about a tweet, tweets are very unique because they travel. It's not just on the Twitter platform. So you see tweets distributed on media sites, on third party sites. So while we have the 285 million or so monthly active users, we also have about 500 million people who will come to um, Twitter and the logged out experience. They might visit a tweet, they may visit um, a, a profile page and whatnot. So you have um, to see so it on the internet, or maybe or are you are you including people who see like a ESPN including a tweet in the broadcast? Yeah, we're not. Does that count as that 500 million? Or no, no, we don't count that. So you you will see on air, you'll see on ESPN, you'll see on NBC The Voice, you'll see you know lots of integration on air. We don't count that. It's difficult because it's broadcast. So you've got an audience of 285 million people who used, who have logged in, people like in. me, tweeting all day, instead right. of doing work. Um, and then you've got other people who are regular people, and they just encounter tweets on the internet in some capacity, and that's basically double your audience, or not quite double. But. That's right. I mean, when news breaks, it often breaks on Twitter, right? It's the first place where people will discover some kind of breaking event, whether it's you know the events going on in Ferguson or now in New York, um, if it's people discovering Peter Pan Live, which is going on right now, so we have a hard stop. Yeah, no, um, I'm sorry. You know, so there are a number of you know breaking moments um, from sort of the the absurd to the you know serious, um, and this happens all around the world every second. And then part of Twitter's challenge broadly, right, is to say, all right, we've got this bigger audience than the logged in audience, we need to figure out how to turn that into money at some point. That's not your job. It's not my job. Your no. job is to build that audience to get more people contributing. Yeah, our job is, you know, how do we um, have the greatest content? How do we create, and maybe I'll unpack, as you say, um, participation experiences and what that means. Oh, that was the word I couldn't get. Yeah. The phrase, participation okay, sorry, experiences. Yeah. So, um, so what that means is how do you help um, uh, engage with users um, on Twitter? So on a Twitter card, for example, you have the ability to, um, to, uh, to vote or to poll. Twitter um, card sort of the expanded version of the tweet, the bigger tweet. Exactly. So I'll give an, a, an example. So LeBron James, arguably the most popular and the best basketball player today. And as he was approaching game day, um, and, uh, and obviously a big moment to return to the Cavs, he came to Twitter, um, first and foremost, and asked his fans using our cards platform to say, should I do the chalk toss, which was his pregame uh, he ritual. Air, yeah. He threw out the, the, the talcum powder and the, and the chalk. And of course, 95% of his fans said yes. 
Um, and that gave the audience and his fans an opportunity to determine the outcome. And does he say, come to you and say, I would like to do this specific thing? Or does he come to you and say, I want to do something and you guys suggest that? How does that work? It goes both ways. So sometimes we'll go to the various um, teams knowing that this was going to be a big event. We can talk to them. Sometimes they'll come to us. And this happens across the gamut of sports and television. Um, there are a number of predictive events, right? Like we know when the Grammys are, the Oscars are, the Super Bowl and so forth. So a lot of times we'll go to our partners with a bunch of ideas and sometimes they'll come to us. It goes both ways. And you're not charging them. They're not paying you for this. This is all happening free of charge. That's right. And this helps you because if LeBron James works with you guys that builds up the Twitter platform. It's win, win, win. So in the case of LeBron James, it was great for LeBron to be able to have this sort of very personal experience with his fans. It was great for the Cavs to get everybody really psyched about game day. Um, it was great for Twitter, great for our users to be able to have the opportunity. And the other thing too, and actually one of my favorite parts of this example, is that that tweet, that participation experience was actually embedded on a number of different media partner sites. So it was on the Bleacher Report, it was on Fox, it was on right. USA Today, and it gave our media partners an opportunity to get fresh, live, interactive content on their sites. But there's a talent war going on, right? Like Facebook primarily is fighting you for these celebrities now, right? They want to get them on Facebook, or they're encouraging them, or maybe even paying them to use Facebook. Um, I use Instagram, I, I, someone's got a campaign. It's not, it must not be a very good ad campaign because I don't know who it's for, but it features LeBron James in a dress, dunking. Um, so how do, you, how do you get someone to use Twitter instead of Instagram? Well, Twitter is the only place that has a number of different attributes or characteristics, right? It's live, it's public, it's conversational, and it's widely distributed. So again, tweets travel. Only on Twitter could LeBron James have this sort of interaction experience that was not, ju not just on the Twitter platform, but again, embedded on all these different third-party sites. So it's, it's, a, it's, a different, it's a different offering to partners. Do you, do, you, do you demand exclusivity? You say, we'll do this chalk toss thing with you, but you've got to cool it on the Instagram. We talk to our partners about a variety of different ways that they can increase their engagement. So here's an example. So One thing but did you ask them to not use Facebook or Instagram? Um, no, we're public. So I mean, so you can see, you can go to Twitter. You can publish uh, a link to Instagram. You can, like, you can go from Twitter to other places, but you can't necessarily go from other places back to. Can Twitter. LeBron James work with Instagram and work with you at sure, the same time? Of course, you're, you're cool of with course. it. No problem. Okay. Twitter is the best place, of course. But Twitter yeah, is the best yeah. place. So when Twitter started off, it was it was 140 characters, and you could have a link in there, and eventually they added photos, and that got yeah. more sophisticated. Now there's a you can play music while you're while you're tweeting. That's right. Um, you guys announced recently you're going to do a lot more with video. You're already doing vines. Um, it looks like Twitter is creating more and more ways to spend more time on Twitter by consuming media, which means and by the way, you guys make money selling advertising. That sure sounds like Twitter is a, a media company, right? I mean, you're head of media at Twitter, but it sounds like Twitter is a media company. We're not a media company. So we are you know, a communications platform that actually helps service the media business. Um, and I'll share some examples. Again, so not just creating content uh -huh. or getting content and distributing that content, but we also have a team um, in the revenue organization um, that helps media partners with high quality content. Yeah, because you're sort of making skipping money. ahead to where I was going to go with this, which right. it seems like if I'm, especially a media company, right. it's cool that I can put my stuff out on Twitter and you guys help distribute it and that's great for me and it's free, but it also seems like I'm building up your business and I'm building up a competitor. Either it's a competitor today or one day will be a competitor. I think about ESPN a lot. Um, I, can, I could have watched most of the World Cup this summer on Twitter. It's a really good way to get scores and even highlights. Um, but ESPN had paid for those rights and I didn't have to watch the game there. I could sort of get it all via Twitter. If I'm ESPN, shouldn't I be concerned that I'm building your business up at their expense? No, we, I mean, we have a great relationship with ESPN and with you know, many media organizations around the world. And the relationship that we have is very symbiotic. Um, so not only are we working with them on helping with distribution and, and, and breaking that content on Twitter and sending users back, but we also have colleagues at Twitter on the, our Amplify team that will work with them as they have this premium content. Either they can go ahead and sell that content, our team can sell that content, and we can share in that revenue. So we're always looking at ways to not just help with traffic, but also to help with revenue. So you can help them generate revenue. Sure. Uh, and that's how you, and, but still, my, 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 I can only put my eyeball on one screen at a time, right? So spending more time on Twitter, maybe it's at ESPN's expense, maybe it's someone else's expense. Aren't, don't you get feedback from them saying, we're a little uneasy about 
whatever it is that you're doing. Maybe it's video. They're a little concerned about that. Doesn't that come back to you? Not really. I mean, I'll give another example. So television, right? Like, does Twitter take away from the TV experience? It doesn't. It actually is the ultimate companion experience to watching television. Um, and there's been a lot of research around this. Nielsen, obviously one of our big partners, but a lot of third parties have done a lot of research showing that Twitter actually helps drive in um, some tune in and excitement and conversation. So it doesn't distract from sort of that media relationship. So uh, you know, people are used to having multiple devices in front of them yeah. at any particular time. It actually helps complement that experience. So when I'm watching Peter Pan, I'm going to tweet about it. Actually, I know everyone's tweeting about Peter Pan. I know, Pan everyone's very speak. distracted. We really should get off stage. Yeah. Um, uh, you should have like a Twitter wall so we can follow it a little bit. it would distract from you. So you can only watch one thing at a time. Um, uh, you, guys, you, guys went to you guys went to TV very early on. You said, we're going to work with TV. That's going to be a big part of our business. Sort of was on form for a while. Now it seems more form. But I'm still a little confused about your messaging there. Are you saying that you can boost ratings for television shows um, if they participate in Twitter or something else? It seems like it changes periodically. What's it at now? So just going back a bit, you know, when our founders built Twitter, I don't think that they had the intention that this would be made as sort of a complementary experience to television. Right. It has kind of evolved. And, um, and it's something that, um, that we've noticed over the years that Twitter has helped drive the conversation. And for the first time ever, for broadcasters, they can actually measure the conversations that people are having about their show. They can also get a sense of, you know, what do people like and what do people not like. It's become this sort of social soundtrack experience, right? You can understand what's going on in real time. And we've seen broadcasters um, and production companies, and we've been doing this now around the world, leverage Twitter to be able to drive in conversations. Um, and you see a couple of different spectrums. You see sort of the higher ratings, and you also see so high. You, to be clear, so you think that Twitter can boost ratings? Twitter is big enough that for a TV show of a certain size, you can actually show a demonstrable We've rise seen a lot of third party ratings. research about this. And again, it's early, right? You see Nielsen doing this. Fox um, had a recent study that was super interesting that talked about something like 90% of people that had seen a tweet about television took action um, both on online and offline related to that experience. So I think we're still in the very early stages of understanding the relationships, um, the causal, the correlation, and so forth. Um, but it's something that's really, really interesting and also something that is really unique for Twitter um, compared to every other platform because of our public attributes and because it's live and because you can follow people who have similar interests. And not what do you mean because of your public attributes? What does that mean? Well, because we're the only platform that is public by nature, right? That you can As opposed have to Facebook, where it's the, part of it's closed off. Right? That's the distinction. Well, yeah. I mean, Twitter as a platform that, um, you, like, I can follow a couple of friends, but I also follow people who have similar interests in right. me. I follow Ramona um, on <laughs> Owen's dog, Ramona. We have similar, well, I know that's probably Owen oh, asked me if I followed Ramona but, this morning. I, <laughs> no, sorry. But you, I mean, you follow people with similar interests, or you can follow a certain subject matter. Right. You can follow, you know, the serious issues going on in the world. You can follow what's going on in Ebola, and these interests evolve over time. So it's just, I'm kind of getting off top, topic a little bit, but um, but as a platform, um, we are public, um, we are live, and for television or whatever the interest may be, um, it's something that we're uniquely suited for. And again, this is something that Facebook didn't participate in for a long time. You guys sort of had TV to yourself, and over the last year, they sort of, for whatever reason, decided that they would like to be participating in this as well. And they've got a trending box now, so when the World Cup's going on, they'll say, hey, we're talking about the World Cup. And um, are, do you, are you guys seeing the effect of what Facebook is trying to do to sort of catch up to what you're doing? Does that register with you? Well, we're focused on what Twitter is doing and how Twitter is working with broadcasters. That's the political answer. <laughs> yes. We'll talk about your previous job, too, in a second. But so, so the answer is no. You, it, doesn't, it doesn't show up. We're focused on the Twitter business. Because before you had this, this version of this job, your predecessor, there was a, it, was, it's, it was very inside baseball, but there was an actual fight with the networks and Facebook. And you guys went to the, the networks and said, you guys can't work with Facebook if you want to get our best data. And you can't show tweets on, you can't show Facebook posts on, uh, on, on baseball stadiums if you want to get our best data. It, it, they flipped. Right, and that was an old regime and you're not there. But do you, it seems like that had at least registered psychologically with, with Twitter, that they understood Facebook was doing this. 
I'd love to talk to you about the forward-looking strategy, which is um, how we continue to work with broadcasters. And, and I should mention, in all seriousness, I mean, one of the things that's been exciting for us and how we work with television and something that is also super fun at Twitter is just our global audience, right? And so we've been able to work with not just broadcasters, but similar in the US where we work with Nielsen. Um, we've worked with Nielsen now in Italy and Australia. Um, we're working with Kantar Media in the UK um, and in Spain. We recently announced our partnership um, and uh, the launch of ratings in Spain as well. So it's something in video research in Japan. So as we're thinking about um, uh, building our network, building the content, making it easier and a more complimentary experience for our users to be able to follow their favorite shows, talk about their favorite shows, and giving broadcasters, again, for the first time ever, this opportunity to measure the public conversation. It's a really exciting place to be. So I'm a big Twitter fan. I tweet all the time, again, in lieu of work sometimes. Um, so you don't need to sell me on the attributes. But I also know that there's, there's some dark parts of Twitter, right? It's, it's anonymous, and you see a lot of vicious mm -hmm. stuff there. Um, what are you guys doing to sort of make that more appealing to a celebrity that's sort of venturing into Twitter? Sure. Um, so we know that abuse is an issue offline, right? And we know it's an issue on the internet too. And it's important for us and for Twitter to be the safest place to have a public conversation. Um, and so earlier this week, as you probably know, um, we released uh, a new update to make it easier for people to report abuse, not just for celebrities and high profile content creators, but for anybody. So, And it's not just putting the onus and the burden on the individual who's feeling abused, um, but if you see abuse, that you can actually report it. On, um, abuse, on someone's behalf. On somebody else, yeah, on someone's behalf, which is great because it allows us to sort of benefit from the wisdom of the crowds and, um, and making this a simpler, better process. Um, and it's just the beginning. So we have a lot of work to do. We know that. There's a lot of conversations out there. And wanna, again, we want to make Twitter the safest place for people to have a conversation. There's a sort of ongoing tension with Twitter and other internet platforms, right, about how much free speech, how much freedom you can allow your users, right? You can publish anything you want up until the point where you, there's something you can't publish. Like no one wants child pornography on their site. Right. You guys have had issues with, with most recently uh, terrorists betting stuff, you've said, no, we're not going to have that. Are you involved in those, in those decisions about what you're going to allow on the platform and what you're not? Our team, not so much. So we have a great, our legal team, our trust and safety teams, they're the ones that on a day in and day out basis, they're evaluating these things and making sure that we're evolving our policies. Um, my team is sort of on the front line of a lot of these issues around the world. And so they're hearing it from, um, you know, it could be from the movie stars, from the sports talent, from the politicians, um, when they find like certain areas of abuse and we'll ha help escalate those issues and understand them and let our team know this is what we're hearing from the ground. Do you think that if you tighten Twitter up if you made it harder to post whatever you wanted, it might actually make the platform bigger because it would be sort of easier to navigate for a regular person? I'm not sure. I don't think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's on us to make Twitter um, a simpler product to, to use, um, simpler to express oneself, simpler to discover, simpler to consume. Um, but we do need to um, make it easier for people when bad stuff does happen to be able to report it and feel like they can have um, a great experience on the platform. So prior to this, prior to this job, you, you worked at the White House. Prior to that, you worked at Google. How does Twitter sort of compare organizationally to, to the White House <laughs> and to Google? It's kind of sandbagging the question. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, Twitter's been, I, I feel very fortunate. I've had a, a lot of great jobs, and Twitter's been you know, one of the amazing, the, the most amazing opportunity of a lifetime. And, um, and I think the common thread across all these three um, experiences has been seeing how technology can be used as a force for good. Um, at the White House and the State Department, um, the government had used had used Twitter, had used a number of different platforms, and used SMS as a way to connect with citizens. Um, Google, too, has done an amazing job with helping us you know, connect to one another to get information um, to, um, and to use technology for good. Very cool. Um, I have other questions, but again, I want to open it up to you guys. Someone's got a question here in the front. If you can throw a microphone their way. I recognize you. It's Ryan. Hi, uh, Ryan Lowell with TechCrunch. So uh, most times when a tech company has a lot of like new product stuff that's coming out, they you know hold a big conference and invite the tech press and you know tell them about all the new cool stuff coming up. Um, but you guys told Wall Street a few weeks ago. Um, why did you feel like you had to, you know, do that explaining to financial analysts as opposed to, you know, 
the technology press? To be honest, I mean, I wasn't part of that part of the conversation. I imagine um, some of the stuff that was released was because we were ready and ready to have that conversation. So I don't think that you'll see that sort of as a trend. We did, that was our first analyst day. I'm not sure when the next one is. I think you'll be continue, you will continue to be notified at TechCrunch and the other media organizations when we have new developments, but I think that was sort of a one-time experience. Do you feel like Wall Street gets what you guys are doing? There's a sort of back and forth about whether or not they understand your goals. I think so. I mean, it's a bit out of my domain. I don't spend much time talking with Wall Street at all. Um, so we presented our media strategy at Analyst Day, and it was live stream. So it, you know, it's obviously a public. What's the feedback you get when you present your media strategy to? The analysts really positive. I think um, they see the potential. They see the high quality content. They see the interactions. They see the global opportunity. Um, my role at Twitter, since I've been at the company for four and a half years, has always been global, um, and so we see so much potential around the world. Um, I was in India a couple of weeks ago, and it's a fantastic market for us. Um, Japan, Brazil, all these markets where we're really just getting started, um, and especially with our local teams on the ground, we've hired amazing people who come from the media industry, so they speak sort of the language of media. They want to you know, ensure that we're not there to disrupt, but to complement their businesses. Um, but they also come with a great passion for Twitter and technology, and sort of that magic intersection of media and technology is a huge opportunity for us. I like media and technology. Are there, are there other questions in the audience? There's one back there. Hi, my name is Sharath. I'm the owner of HipHopDX.com. We have 300,000 uh, Twitter followers right now. How many Twitter followers do you need in order to team up with your best practices team? There's no sort of magic number. I'm happy to get your card afterwards and figure out how we can help you guys. What was it? Hip Hop what? EX. EX, OK. Hip Hop EX. Got another question right here. Thanks, uh, Johnny the Circle Up. Um, so Recode recently killed comments, um, mostly because you see that the discussion layer around both online and offline media is on Twitter, yet the user experience still sucks. And then I have to read a Recode article, I have to go and search on Twitter and find the discussion. Do you see yourself going after Discuss and Live Fire and embedding yourself on top of media platforms and becoming more sort of integrated approach to that discussion layer? Yeah, I, saw, I read one of the debates about it. Personally, I haven't been spending that much attention thinking about that. I think it's an interesting question. Um, I think it's an interesting opportunity, but that's really a question for the product team. Or you could ask Walt and Kara, because they're the ones who Yeah, what do they comments. think? What do you think, Kara? You have an opinion. <laughs> what? There you go. Okay. So perfect, yeah. So, you know, send all your complaint tweets to at Kara Swisher. <laughs> She's heard them before. Not at Walt. Not Walt. No, just Kara. Other questions from the audience? I see a hand, a meek hand. I think it's Mark back there. Hey, Mark Glaser again. So you, have, you were talking about you had 285 million regular users. You've got hundreds of millions more that are looking at it. Isn't that enough to build a business, 285 million? Why do you have to spend so much time getting celebrities, building the business, getting it bigger, 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 bigger? Why, why is bigger? Why is that so important for your business? I think like any company, you're always looking to scale. And one of our goals is to have the world's largest daily audience. You know, We're ambitious in terms of how can we reach every person on the planet and make Twitter um, a great experience and a daily habit. So you know, we're really happy with the, the number of users that we have. We want to continue to grow um, and, uh, and, and make Twitter the most delightful um, thing that they can do every day to be able to consume news, to be able to express themselves. If you want to reach a billion users, you should. You should get on it. And then you got Peter Pan to watch. So I'm going to let you I go. I know. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for yes. coming.